Now, finally, I have the honor of introducing tonight's speaker. Dr. Robert Casanello is an Associate Professor of History at the Uni University of Central Florida. He's an author of the book, To Render Invisible, Jim Crow and Public Life in New South Jacksonville, which, alongside his research into Reconstruction Era Florida, were crucial sources in our research for this exhibit. Dr. Casanello is also the creator of the History of Central Florida podcast, a 50-episode investigation into the storied history of Central Florida told through objects found at local museums and historical societies. Tonight, Dr. Casanello has joined us to share his knowledge about black suffrage in Florida, setting the stage before we open up the new exhibit downstairs. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Casanello. Thank you. Let me start off and apologize. I'm uh, sick with a sinus um, problem all week. I'm actually feeling really better today compared to the beginning of the week. So, but that may not um, be great for my voice today. But, uh, I'm feeling good. <laughs> be all right. uh, thank you for that very kind, um, kind introduction. I'm curious now to see what um, this is in the exhibit. It's, based on what you just said, um, but fantastic. So um, I want to do a talk tonight on uh, black suffrage in Florida, and it's part of a um, uh, book-length manuscript I'm finishing that I'll probably send to my publisher this summer and towards the tail end. Every year I get close to finishing, and then the legislature meets, and I just say, oh, i got to stop now. <laughs> do parts of this all over again. Um, but I promised myself I wouldn't let the, the, the legislature disrupt me anymore. So, um, <laughs> so it will be finished um, this summer, sent to the publisher, come out. But it actually, um, my interest, I'll talk a little bit about my interest in how I got onto the project, and then talk a little bit about what I'll, I'll talk about tonight. But um, my book on Jacksonville, To Render Invisible, um, I was sort of interested in, um, I was interested in Jim Crow segregation and, and um, the culture of Jim Crow in, in Jacksonville as a city. And one of the chapters in there um, I did on voting. I did on uh, disfranchisement in the city of Jacksonville from the end of the Civil War until 1920, which is which are the, the years of the, um, of the book. And what had happened, um, this might engender some uh, Q&A after, and please feel free to ask me about this because I can't talk about it now. Um, but uh, what happened, and I don't know if you all remember this, because you all, you all were never in, um, oh, what was her name? The, you know the district that got disputed that runs through Jacksonville down to Orlando? It used to be called District Brown. 5. Yeah. Print Brown. You were you're all in Print Brown, sister. No, that's not, it didn't come through here, right? Was, I think it's like, it's Jacksonville, um, the La Villa section right down to Orlando, and Eatonville, and things like that. Um, so in 20, this would have been 2011, I think. No, it would have been after that, after the book came out. So around maybe 2013 or so. Um, Lawyers who work with Krim Brown contacted me to be an expert witness on the trial to preserve that district, that snake district that went through. And I said to him, I said, hey, I, I only do to 1920. <laughs> so, I don't know how much help I'm going to be um, on, on, your, on your current uh, fight for your current district. Uh, and of course, that at the time was, you know, if I wanted to, right? Yeah, I don't know that I'm much help anyway. So they said, well, you've done this piece, because they were familiar with my piece on voting in Jacksonville, or disfranchisement in Jacksonville. And they said, oh, well, you know, let me, let's add, let me ask you this. Um, what if we paid you to essentially take that piece and expand it out to the rest of the 20th century and do the rest of Florida? And I was like, wow, you're talking like years. <laughs> and they actually hired me researchers and stuff, and I was like, yeah, sure, if you want to do that. You're going to pay my research bills, absolutely. Yeah, I can't say no to that. Right. So I had like a lawyer sugar daddy for a little while. <laughs> and I was doing that research. Um, so it was, 
I was the expert witness on uh, to preserve Corinne Brown's district. It was District 5 at the time. Um, it was the state of Florida, really the Florida legislature, the NAACP, Southern Poverty Law Center, on the other side who were trying to introduce a different um, map were the Florida League of Women Voters, the Florida Democratic Party. I'm not sure there's anybody else um, on that end either. Um, but I would, they only asked me disfranchisement questions. I didn't go in and say, this is a perfect district. Or I, I didn't go in, I was an expert which defend the district. They just wanted to ask questions about disfranchisement. They wanted someone to be able to answer those questions. And oddly enough, not a lot of historians have written about disfranchisement in Florida. Um, very, very little has been written. I've written an article um, that was based on some of the research I did for the, for the court case um, eventually, but no one's really written about um, the, the history of disfranchisement in Florida. So when I got um, finished with the lawsuit, then I was legally free to do whatever I wanted to do with that research because the law firm owned the research while the case was going on, so I couldn't really use it unless they gave me permission to use it. So then I thought, oh, well, you know, there's no book on the um, disfranchisement in Florida, so I kind of turned my attention to that, and I just got really interested on suffrage and the notion of suffrage and the right to vote, and so I kind of really kind of expanded it. So um, since then, I really looked into um, suffrage and voting in Florida all the way from um, British Florida, I know you mentioned British Florida earlier, so I'll talk a little bit about British Florida. Uh, all the way to, um, or at least this manuscript will be all the way to, to the present. Um, so, if I get it done, right? That's the big thing. <laughs> My publisher keeps saying, when, when are you going to get this done? We're waiting to publish this. You don't know how badly you want to publish this. I'm like, DeSantis is going to come after you. And they go, we don't care. We're going to publish it. I was like, all right. Well, sure. As long as you've got lawyers, I'm good. All right, so um, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about black suffrage. And uh, I've done talks like this before, and I usually found that I overwhelm information with, with um, audiences. And so I don't want to do that tonight. I'd rather maybe um, spend half the time talking about what I have here and then half the time doing Q&A. And if you've got things you, you, you want to talk about or, or want to know more about, I should be able to recall uh, that information, we can talk about it here, uh, rather than me figuring out what you might want to hear uh, from me. And so I'm just going to do kind of a bare bones, basic sort of outline of um, black suffrage here, and then we can go maybe into a conversation um, and see how that works out. Um, you know, just, uh, just save the tomatoes and rotten fruit for the end. Don't, <laughs> don't expel it all early here. Right? Uh, this one. It's the uh, second button down on the right. Ah, there we go. All right, colonial elections. All right, so like I said, uh, when, I, when um, I got finished with my um, obligation with the court case, I went back and I wanted to look into um, really the early instances of um, voting in Florida. And so um, the first elections held in Florida, there were no elections in the first Spanish period. So, you know, the Spanish uh, come to Florida. Uh, it was a, Florida was a Spanish colony for, for a few centuries. And then um, um, after the French and Indian War, um, Florida is transferred to the British and becomes a British colony for about 20 years during the period of time that we refer to as the American Revolution. Um, and so uh, the British divide Florida up into two separate colonies, East and West Florida. And um, the, the British government during this period, um, in the, um, I believe in the late 1860s, actually encouraged um, the settlers, the um, plantation owners, and the 
subjects who are living in East and West Florida to hold elections and create an assembly. That's the word they use, an assembly. Um, so they, they didn't necessarily, per se, have representation over in the British Parliament, but the, um, the English government gave them permission, authority, to have an assembly of their own. So there was a, there was a, and the, the governor of East Florida actually kind of takes this up, creates an assembly, and allows um, landowners, white landowners, to vote. Uh, British subjects too. Spanish um, who were there remained from the first um, Spanish period. Couldn't vote. Oh, I'm sorry. And they had to be Protestant. Too. Uh, Catholic Menorcans who were in East Florida could not vote in those elections. They had an assembly. And it lasted for a few years. Similar thing happens in West Florida, but West Florida had to really be prodded. And I think there's like no overlap between the two assemblies. So East Florida has their assembly experiment. It comes and it goes. And then uh, West Florida has theirs, even though their authority came at the same time. It took West Florida just a really long time for the governor of West Florida to kind of um, get an assembly organized. Um, but in West Florida, um, there were, I believe there were no property restrictions in West Florida. Um, which made a big difference from East Florida at the time. <clears throat> okay, so um, the British have um, East and West Florida during uh, what we refer to as the American Revolution during those years. And then it transfers, after the American Revolution, it transfers back to Spain, and Spain keeps the East and West Florida colonies as separate colonies. They don't combine them like it was during the first Spanish period. But there's no more assemblies. There's no more voting or anything like that going on um, when the Spanish come back in the second period until um, Napoleon. And what Napoleon does um, is kind of um, pushes the uh, Spanish monarchy out of um, you know, out of Spain into the south of Spain, into Cadiz. And at this time. Um, this would be like the late tens, early 1820s. Um, at this time, uh, the Spanish colonies in Latin America are starting to um, rebel and try and forming their own um, nation nation states. And so, in, in or at least it's it's brewing. Right, it's, it's brewing. It's not really happened yet, but it's brewing. And so, um, one of the advisors to the Spanish king recommends that, well, if you give them this constitution, give them um, some participatory government, then they won't revolt against you like the United, you know, like the United States did to Britain. Basically, was the argument. And so, there's this Cadiz constitution that's created over <coughs> Spain and is sent over to the Spanish colonies. And it's actually sent over to um, to East Florida. I'm not I'm not sure if it was so big in West Florida, but in East Florida it was sent over. And actually, anybody ever seen the? There's a, a marker for the Cadiz Constitution in Saint Augustine. Have you ever seen it? Uh, I don't know the historic town of Saint Augustine too well, but there's a point on like the main main drag of the historic district where it's that there's that like nice church in the historic society. In front of that, there's a plaque that says the Caddy's Constitution, you know, govern the or something like that. Um, so you can actually see it there and learn a little bit about the Caddy's Constitution. So the Caddy's Constitution gave um, um, Spanish subjects um, the authority to vote if they owned property. Or, and if they were Spanish citizens, they would have to be Spanish citizens. So actually what it did is, is some of the British who remained in East Florida under the Caddy's Constitution, and the Caddy's Constitution only existed, for those of you that are Constitution, um, you know, Felix or something, it was only around for like three months in San Jose, it wasn't very long. Uh, but for the three months it was there, there were some British subjects who were holdovers that actually um, became Spanish subjects so they could vote in this, with this Caddy's Constitution. So it kind of came and it went, but it was there, and there was um, there was an assembly. They met, they passed some ordinances and things like this. 
So they actually did practice um, some semblance of a, a, a representative uh, government. All right, uh, moving on here. Okay, here is, um, this is the one thing I could find for our locality here. I was trying to look for some other things, but I just couldn't find anything uh, uh, in any of the materials I had for um, Amelia Island or Fernandina or anything like this. But um, I do have this. And oh, there'll be a second thing. I'm sorry, I do have one more. Um, I have this on the um, 1817 um, Second Patriot Revolt, right? That one? You don't call it the Second Patriot. So the first Patriot Revolt was um, in East Florida, and a group of privateers tried to, um, went from Georgia into Florida, into North Florida, try to wrestle uh, Spanish Florida uh, from the Spanish monarchy and, and sort of return it, if you will, return it to um, the United States to become a, um, to become a state, presumably. And it failed. It's, that's from 1812. Like it happened at the beginning of the War of 1812. In 1817, there was a second attempt at this, and it's actually, to, for me, it's actually a much more interesting um, episode. And this actually, uh, the revolt takes place in Amelia Island. There's a group of privateers, and they're actually coming instead of coming from Georgia south, they're coming from the Caribbean north. They're actually um, in many different places in the Caribbean. Some of them in Latin American countries, Mexico, uh, Colombia, things like this. And they're coming in 1817 to um, Amelia Island. And they come and they storm Amelia Island. They drive the Spanish out and they want to claim um, Amelia Island. And East Florida has this new nation. I, I don't know that they had so much design to um, have the US take over East Florida. I think they really thought they were creating a whole new nation. And what's sort of interesting about this case is that um, unlike the 1812 incident, in 1817 the um, privateers were multinational, multiracial. It wasn't like these white dudes from Georgia coming in and trying to overtake the Spanish colony. And so they really were trying to create this kind of new nation, if you will. Um, and they were on the cusp of creating a constitution. Um, in fact, they had created a document, and I don't think the document has survived um, in its original form, but it was printed in this newspaper that I have here in the Charleston Courier, I believe it is. And you can see what, this was the um, voting criteria for the group of people who would elect those who would write the Constitution for, um, uh, for whatever this new nation was going to be. And you can see it says, every free inhabitant who shall have resided 15 days previous to this, or 15 days, that's pretty good. <laughs> for voting criteria, you think, you think the state of Florida would go for that? Yeah, after your 15 days, go ahead. Here's your voter ID. Cast a vote. Um, and you had to swear an oath to this, um, the Republic of Florida, I guess is what they were calling it here in this document. Um, and again, what's interesting here is presumably, if we're to believe this text, you know, um, there wasn't a racial requirement to vote. It British Florida, Spanish Florida, there were racial requirements to vote. Um, and of course, the United States has racial requirements to vote, only white men. And gender, I'm sorry, race and gender. Um, presumably, um, free inhabitants is white men in this, in this republic as well. I'm sorry, I'll acknowledge that. <clears throat> and so you can imagine what people in the US thought. This is, this is 18. 17, right? Just what, like a little bit over a, a decade or so from Haiti, right? And you got some, you know, some, you got an interracial group of privateers taking over the Spanish colony, right? And then they're voting, right? And so 
the U.S. government in 1817 got really interested in this and sent a naval uh, ship down to um, to remove the um, the privateers away. So, like before, they were actually going to have their constitutional convention. <laughs> Uh, the day before, the naval ship comes in and they all uh, evacuate. Uh, and then the, the colony is, or at least Amelia Island is returned back to the Spanish. And of course, between these two things, between the 1812 and the 1817 revolt, um, this made um, Spain look really weak, like they couldn't hold Florida. Um, and there was also a revolt going on in West Florida, where Pensacola is. Um, Years before, um, years before this. So all over East and West Florida it looked like Spain really couldn't hold East or West Florida. So this is sort of was the, the pretense for uh, Florida to secede, um, or Spain to secede Florida to, uh, to the U.S. with the Adam O'Neill Treaty um, later on. All right. Um, Right. So, one thing I have in my notes here was um, one of the things this the, the news, this newspaper article the the um, Charles and Carter does it has this kind of quote from um, uh, a military official who was sent in to evacuate the um, <coughs> evacuate the privateers who said that we have to do this because um, and this is the quote um, quote. Um, blacks are seeking superiority over whites down there in, um, in Spanish Florida. So, um, uh, there'll be a recurring theme as we'll, as we'll see here. All right, um, moving on. Okay, this is actually, um, this is when this is after the U.S., this is 1824, after the U.S. Um, acquires Florida. And um, this, I believe, is, I, I believe it's called a, a charter. And so, um, and this would have been, I'm sorry? Okay. This would have been, all of the um, places in Florida would have had to do this with the legislature that had just been assembled and their transition of government from Spanish uh, Spanish colony to the United States, things like this, to the U.S. territory. And so um, the legislature would have written these up and passed them uh, for all the different municipalities in Florida, the counties, the cities, the towns, all this stuff. So this is the one for, for, uh, for Nina. And I just kind of brought this up because I wanted to show you, um, you know, this actually included who is eligible to vote. Um, in this in this municipality, and you can see that all free white inhabitants um, part of Amelia um, Island, sort of what um, what it was recognizing um, at this point in time. So women were not inhabitants. That's correct, according to uh, this document. Then, right? Uh, exactly. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And I also want to point out, too, um, is I should, I should back up a little bit. But note, at this point in time, the notion of suffrage is changing in America. Um, and we're moving into what um, some historians used to refer to as the Jacksonian period. And um, this is a time when suffrage um, for white men over the age of 21 becomes... Um, more democratic, right? Because uh, before the 1820s in the U.S., most um, most communities, most states, and the federal government had um, property requirements to voting for the white men who were eligible to vote at the time. Right? There was there was property requirement. Um, a, a few northeastern municipalities, starting in I think. 1808 or 1809 uh, begin to um, do away with property requirements for voting on municipal elections and things. Sometimes state elections without property requirements. 
And um, what happens is the War of 1812 begins this conversation to uh, expand suffrage and expand suffrage to include veterans, veterans of the War of 1812. The idea is that they were fighting the British, they were kicking the British out of the US or invaded uh, the United States at that point in time. And that when they return to their communities, they should at least be given the right to vote, even if they didn't own property. And so it kind of changed this mindset around voting to kind of uh, make voting a little bit more expansive than was thought at the birth of the nation. And so this is what happens in 1824 here, is that um, uh, voting in Florida actually becomes a little bit, a little bit more um, expansive than it was um, in, I think, 1838, when Florida has its first kind of draft constitution, territorial constitution. It actually uh, includes um, suffrage for all white men over the age of 21 and doesn't have a property qualification and explicitly says there's no property qualification to voting. Um, all right. Moving on. Okay, this is a letter that was published in the um, Florida Herald and Southern Democrat, 1824, which is a St. Augustine newspaper. And it's from a gentleman who lived in St. Augustine. Excuse me, his name is Robert Brown. And this is probably for me is the most fascinating letter. Um, I've ever seen in regards to voting rights before the Civil War, let me say. Um, this is the only instance, the only documented reporting of an African American uh, man advocating for the right to vote in Florida, in Florida. I've never seen anything like this anywhere else, or, and I'm not trying to say African Americans did not advocate uh, for the right to vote before um, 1860. But I'm saying we don't have a record of it in this way, that you see someone articulating um, in an argument form why they deserve the right to vote. So uh, Robert Brown was, um, he described himself as a hybrid. Um, he was uh, part black, part white. Um, he refers to uh, he refers to the plantation, um, the plantation owner's son as his brother in this, and makes the case that, well, if my brother can vote, my brother owns property, pays taxes and such and so forth, he can vote. Why can't I vote? Because this, when he writes this, he's free. He's not enslaved. And he says, um, I own property. I take taxes. In fact, he's actually, because the laws in, um, I believe it was the city ordinances in, in St. Augustine at the time, he actually was paying more than his brother in taxes. He's making the case, I'm paying more than my brother's in taxes, yet I don't get the right to vote. And he explicitly makes this demand in this letter, um, advocating for the right to vote. And I don't think anyone's ever been able to, to find him in any of the records after this letter to know what had happened to him. But it's a very kind of interesting and appealing um, argument that he makes. Um, wait. There we go. Sorry. Dick is his brother. Um, and he, it's a very, I mean, he's, he's a, you could tell from the letter, he's, he's very well read. Um, he understands the Enlightenment. He speaks in that he speaks in reference to it, in reference to uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment and things like that. Uh, so, um, this is, like I said, it's a very, a very important letter um, in this regard. And it's, um, and it's in keeping with the rest of the country, at least in the Northeast, where a lot of free blacks had moved to um, during the 1820s, 1830s, who were doing the exact same thing. They were paying taxes. And they were demanding the right to vote, you know? So there's no, at this 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, there's no slavery in states like New York and Connecticut, Massachusetts. And the free blacks who lived there 
were still barred from voting, their children were barred from attending the public schools, things like this. And so there were these really kind of, um, if you want to use the term civil rights organizing in those places at the time, um, to, to demand that African Americans who are paying taxes deserve the rights of citizens. So if you think of it, it's not so much citizens in the nation, right? but citizens in the city, right, in their municipality. If you're paying taxes, thus you're, you enjoy the benefits of, of citizenship, and that's sort of what they were articulating. And uh, Robert Brown is doing the same thing here um, with, um, with, with the St. Augustine letter. Okay. All right. Now we're moving on back to back to Ferdinand. All right. This is actually a letter. Um, this is a letter from uh, Chief Justice Salmon Chase to President Andrew Johnson, um, who was president during Reconstruction. So the Civil War happens, and about midway through the Civil War, and I believe actually even before the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, the notion and the question about African American men voting um, becomes part of the national dialogue. Um, started initially by free African Americans in Louisiana, uh, primarily around New Orleans, um, and then it comes, you know, becomes part of the national dialogue, right? And so um, there were a group of Northerners who were here in 1865 at the end of the war. Okay, notice the date there, May 21st of this letter. Right. Um, so that would have been uh, less than a month after the war, a little more than a month after the war. Um, and what these group of Northerners do here, and a uh, few of them are friends with Salmon Chase, who comes down and visits them during this time, this is what this letter is about, is they actually organize um, a city election here. Uh, and allow African Americans to vote. They allow them to, to register, to vote, and to vote in a, um, a municipal government, a mayor, um, from African American men um, who voted in May of 1865. And Salmon Chase is talking, describing this to Andrew Johnson, who probably didn't care, um, <laughs> but either way. Um, he sort of, he, this is just describing him, this is Chase describing the scene. What After my friend Bodie. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Okay. At Ferndina. I see Clinch, Fort Clinch. Oh, Fort, yeah. Uh, Fort this Fort. Yeah, I actually have a big screen I, I read these on. Oh, I think what he's saying here is that um, the white citizens were had no problem with black men voting. I, I believe is what he's saying in the letter or in this passage. Okay, and this is I mean this is kind of interesting if you think about the um, urban citizenship argument or municipal citizenship argument because again. You know, this is 18. This is May 1865. There's no, um, there's no 14th Amendment. There's no 13th Amendment. I think either, right? Yeah, there's no 13th Amendment. There's no 14th Amendment, and certainly um, there's no 15th Amendment yet, right? So the there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution allowing African American men to vote. Yet they hold these elections, and how could they do that? Because these are municipal elections, and municipal elections have sort of a you know, uh, are outside of state, sometimes state and federal uh, federal requirements. I guess. All right. It didn't last long. Um, a few weeks in, a um, uh, group of, of whites led by you know, who, what? Yuli. Yuli gets a band of whites together. You know the town Yuli here. 
Yeah. David Yulee. Right. So David Yulee gets a gets a band of white folks together to kind of run this this um, government out of town, uh, hold new elections that were African American men don't vote. Thank you, David. They named a town after a bunch of other stuff too, railroads, all that kind of stuff. All right. All right, the Reconstruction Constitution, a little bit about that. Um, so, um, with, um, with Florida being a participant in the Confederacy, um, at the end of the Civil War, um, the state was seeking entrance back into um, the United States. And so, when I mentioned Andrew Johnson, right? Andrew Johnson, um, he was a Southern governor who became Lincoln's uh, vice president in 1864. And um, although he was uh, an opponent of the Confederacy and secession, you know, he, he wasn't that, um, he wasn't that interested in the um, social or political experiment that Reconstruction could have been or was. Um, at that point in time. And so he didn't really support um, African American rights, African American men voting or anything like that. And uh, he wanted the southern states to come in as quickly as they could. And all the southern states had to do to come into the Union in 1865 was pass a constitution that outlawed slavery and um, required people to take a loyalty oath to the constitution. Oh, and, and, and refute, re repudiate Confederate debt. Those are only three things they had to do. And so Florida and other southern states in the same category created these constitutions, 1865. They talked about um, black suffrage, giving black men the right to vote, and kind of said, no, never, will never happen in Florida, that kind of stuff. And so they created a constitution, they created a government where um, white men uh, over the age of 21 were enfranchised, um, yet again. And the 1865 Constitution actually was very much like the, um, the, territory, the Florida statehood constitution uh, before the Civil War. It was just kind of tweaked here and there uh, for after the war and some things that no longer applied uh, since the antebellum period. Okay, And these reconstruction governments in the South engendered a great deal of hostility with the U.S. Congress. So they then um, um, got together, and this is where you get the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, and they try and push him out, but they only really weaken him. And um, what they do is they sort of um, initiate a military reconstruction of the South. And they send the U.S. Army back into the South. They order all the southern states to have, hold new constitutional convention. They enfranchise um, African American men over the age of 21 to vote in these new constitutional conventions. That happens in Florida, uh, summer of 1867. And so um, all this is going on while Congress is passing first the 14th Amendment then the 15th Amendment. But by the time the 15th Amendment passes, um, African American men over the age of 21 are already voting um, in Florida. They vote for the um, 1868 Constitution, and um, they vote locally. Um, there, um, in the 1868 Constitution, which is often referred to as a radical constitution, but it's not really that radical. Um, is um, enfranchises African American men over the age of 21. And then we see African American men and women participating. Um, as far as men go, I mean, they organize uh, political clubs. They're very involved with the Republican Party. Um, they're running for office. They're holding elected um, offices throughout the state from the local level to the, um, to the state level. <coughs> all of the consternation of um, southern white Democrats in Florida, um, you know, who 
do things like um, create um, these white militias we now refer to as the Klan. Uh, there are a few other um, organizations as well of a similar kind. And they target African Americans, they target uh, white Republicans, um, some cases intimidate them, some cases um, beat them up, some cases kill them, lynch them, some cases massacre an entire town that had a large number of African American, African Americans and Republicans. <coughs> up in Jackson County, there's a famous incident in 1872 called the Jackson County War, where um, Whites just kind of descend on the county because a, a, a majority of county government was elected um, that year. <clears throat> okay, then we get into this. The towards the end of Reconstruction, um, the U.S. government sort of abandons Reconstruction. And the state of Florida sort of is on its own. A republic, I'm sorry, a democratic government is elected, and then Florida by, I believe officially by 1884, I'm sorry, 1874, becomes for all practical purposes a one-party democratic state. And then we see these reforms taking place after uh, Democrats, Southern Democrats control Florida's um, state government. And uh, the first reforms that really kind of, or at least what sets the reforms off at first is the 1885 Constitution, because uh, the state of Florida wanted to get rid of the 1868 Constitution, the Reconstruction Constitution. So they create this 1885 Constitution. And in the 1885 Constitution, they create this. This is, this is what, like, you, you'll, you'll say, oh my god, politicians just don't change over time, right? So the uh, the Constitutional Delegates in 1885 created an article in the Constitution that said something like, um, we will not pass a poll tax, but if a future legislature passes a poll tax, they have the authority to do that or something like that, because the poll tax was this like, big, um, this big um, issue during the 1885 uh, Constitutional debates on the floor. And there were some people who wanted these overt ways to disfranchise black voters, um, black men who were voting, like the poll tax, literacy tests, things like this. And so they all were proposed on the floor. And actually there was um, the African American delegates and the Republican delegates in the Constitutional Convention and the labor people, the people there were, um, there was a labor party in Florida at the time, and they elected delegates to the Constitutional Convention. And they formed this kind of coalition to block all those. So in, in the 1885 Constitution, none of that stuff was blocked. The best they could get was a promise in the future to have a poll tax, but not anything in the 1885 Constitution. And the 1885 Constitution passes, and then it brings forward all these various election reforms. I don't necessarily want to go through every piece, but eventually a poll tax happens, as you can imagine. There's a poll tax floor. There is never a, um, sometimes I see this written erroneously in newspaper articles and stuff, and it drives me crazy. And people say this all the time on the news. And if you ever hear this, you could say, hey, Professor Castanel told me that wasn't true. <laughs> there was never a literacy test in Florida. Florida never had a literacy test. But for some, th there's been literacy tests proposed. There actually was a literacy test amendment passed that never went, never, sorry, it was passed by the legislature but it wasn't passed by the voters. So a literacy test was tried, it was never successful. So it was never a literacy test in Florida. And the reason for that is because of the Australian multiple ballot system. Has anybody ever heard of the Australian multiple ballot system? Nobody's ever heard of that? I bet you have, if I tell you what it is, you're going to be like, oh, I remember that. Some of the young folks in here will remember that. But those of you, that remember the year 2000 will remember. The butterfly ballot? The butterfly ballot is the Australian multi-ballot system. It's the descendant of the Australian multi-ballot system. You know where the, where the names and things kind of line up? It's a little confusing, the ballot. The Australian multi-ballot system um, came here, and I believe it actually is connected to Australia, but it came here, and I think Tennessee 
It's in the South. Tennessee was the first state to adopt the Australian mobile ballot system. And northern um, states and some western states were adopting the Australian mobile ballot system because what the Australian mobile ballot system um, did was produce a paper ballot. So there could be like counting and things like this, right? It actually is a reform. It is a literal reform, right? But what these lawmakers in Tennessee realized was this is a really confusing thing with a lot of instructions. We can knock some votes out of this. And that's what, so they kind of took this thing that was meant to be a reform and they applied it in Tennessee and then later in Florida and then other states did the same thing in the South in order to disfranchise voters who might not be able to read complex instructions. Um, that was sort of its intent, the Australian multiple ballot system. And so this becomes the um, system. And like I said, it, 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 it survived the, the Voting Rights Act of 1865, and, and the, um, the butterfly ballot is its descendant. The butterfly ballot is what the Australian multiple ballot system was, um, or became, I should say. And I, thought, I don't think we have it anymore. I think the butterfly ballots are gone after 2000. I do believe I don't think anyone's voting on a butterfly ballot anymore. But, so that's sort of where um, things sort of end up and why there isn't a literacy test. Because, uh, like I mentioned, in, in the 1910s, the legislature um, drafts an amendment to the Constitution that would have created a literacy test. And opponents on the floor of the legislature said things like, um, why do we need this literacy test? The uh, multiple ballot system disfranchises enough voters for me. We don't need any more voters disfranchised. And what they were afraid of, and this is what they said explicitly, was they were afraid of poor whites being caught up in a literacy test. That's actually, when, when literacy tests come and get debated in Florida, that's the cause. Like, we don't want to disfranchise, we only want to disfranchise black voters, we don't want to disfranchise poor white voters, is what politicians were explicitly arguing. Um, odd enough. All right, universal suffrage, and we'll end a little bit after that. But um, uh, so um, the the the, um, the struggle for women getting the right to vote in Florida comes a little bit later than the rest of the country uh, as far as organizing goes. And that's not to say that women didn't have a role in politics in Florida, uh, white and black women. Uh, in antebellum newspapers and stuff, you, you read these things where, um, like there's this famous story, uh, I think this, this is actually North Carolina, but it should apply it everywhere else. But in North Carolina, there was a, um, a politician, this was before women had the right to vote, there was a politician who was campaigning in the, what was in the 1870s or 1880s, and he was really kind of, you know, um, women should know their place kind of thing and they're the downfall of the men and all this other stuff, vote for me and he, he was getting crowds, all these whipping up all these men that are coming out to see him and stuff like this, right? Um, and so the newspaper was predicting, you know, this is going to be a, a wave election to, you know, kind of reform the wayward women of, you know, this town in North Carolina, wherever it was. And um, he lost the election. And so the next day, the newspaper, um, re, you know, kind of referred it to a, a North Carolina version of, um, was it La Strada, the Greek play, right? Liz Estrada. Liz Estrada, right, where the women withhold their pleasantries of <laughs> their partners. Um, and so that was sort of the, was the explanation of the newspaper, like, oh, maybe women did influence the election, right? <laughs> Possibly. They didn't vote, but they did influence the election. Um, and there's a similar thing going on with um, African American women, uh, especially during Reconstruction in Florida. And I've, I've seen these newspaper articles, um, you know, where um, reporters would complain that um, black women would stand outside the polling places and yell at voters and tell them how they should vote what they should do and things like this. And of course, it wasn't written like, oh, they're trying to participate. No, it was written like these you know, black women are somehow you know, doing something they shouldn't be doing. But they were. They, were, they took an interest and they, uh, 
they did voice their concerns. And um, so, like I said, uh, not only did suffrage start late in Florida, um, the first suffrage organization, I think, isn't until 1896 in Tampa. And it started by transplanted women. These are like women in, I think, New Jersey, who moved to Tampa in the 1890s, and they started a, a women's suffrage organization because they had one in New Jersey. And so there's these women, especially like in Jacksonville, even in Orlando, uh, Tampa, um, these northern women who are coming to Florida um, in the 18, 1810s, really, are building these suffrage organizations to demand for um, women's suffrage in Florida. And there, there aren't really, at least I've, I've not been able to find any um, African-American women's suffrage organizations. Um, it's sort of interesting. What I, what I did learn is that, um, so the, a lot of the women who were in these suffrage organizations started out in what was called women's clubs. And you'd have like women's clubs go back to the 19th century. Um, they weren't a new thing at that point in time. But you had these women's clubs, and women would come to these clubs, and they would talk about things. And sometimes those things would gear you know, uh, into politics and things like this. Like they would read books or whatever, and they would talk about current events or what have you. And so it kind of created this fertile ground to talk about politics and suffrage and things like this, except they would stop just short of suffrage. Because they would say, if we start talking about suffrage, then we're not like it. I don't know if they would use this term, but it was the equivalent of a tax-exempt organization. So that like, like the, the leaders of the women's club would shut the conversation down once it got too political. And certainly suffrage was too political. They would never bring up suffrage. So a lot of these women kind of leave, not leave, but you know, peel off from the club women um, organizations and form these suffrage organizations that then demand and advocate openly for the right to vote. And um, for black women, though, the black women's clubs had no problem talking about suffrage, talking about politics, organizing in the clubs. And so they didn't have these suffrage clubs. That's why you don't see them on the landscape, because their women's clubs could house the suffrage component, whereas the white women's clubs wouldn't, wouldn't allow that from happening. Um, OK, so 1920, uh, we get the 19th Amendment women uh, vote. And um, it brings what I'm referring to as the tale of two cities. The presidential election of 1920. Um, I know if you're from where I'm from, you've heard of Okoye before, right? Have you ever heard of Okoye? You know what Okoye is? The Okoye massacre from 1920, the election. All right, so there's these, what women's suffrage, or, the, or women voting in the 1920 presidential election, what it did is created a great deal of hysteria against African Americans in Florida. Um, if you read the newspapers, Florida newspapers, throughout starting maybe uh, mid-summer of 1920, there is a lot of um, excitement on the part of whites about women registering to vote for the first time. And there's these, there are these stories you see, like I know in Jacksonville, they were all over Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Tampa, and Orlando. Um, black women are registering three times the number of white women. I don't know that that's true. I don't think that that was true based on the figures I've seen. But the newspapers are reporting this, and then people are reading this, and white folks are reading this thinking, oh, there's going to be, um, we're going to go back to Reconstruction and black rule and things like that. And so it created a great deal of white hysteria over um, the coming presidential election of, of 1920. And it actually, in many cities like Orlando, uh, Jacksonville, I believe Lake City, Miami also, uh, the Ku Klux Klan march, the, the, like the days leading to the election, the Ku Klux Klan just did a march down uh, the main street of these cities. Uh, Jacksonville's march was the day before the election. So the tale of two cities, I want to talk a little about Jacksonville and then um, Okawa, and then I'll wrap it up here. Um, but um, in Jacksonville, the Ku Klux Klan marches um, in the city, and Jacksonville was pretty sizable at this time. It's a majority black city, Jacksonville was, in 1920. Um, and the Klan marches, and what's reported in the newspaper, um, especially the black newspapers, is that um, 
African American women come out in large numbers to jeer at the Klan. Like they come out to the Klan parade. You know, they call them all kinds of names. They call them white trash and stuff like this as they're you know, marching down the, the main drag in Jacksonville things. And they just don't appear at all intimidated. Um, and the next day, there are these pictures of African Americans standing blocks and blocks in line to vote in the Jacksonville election, not deterred by the Klan march at all, right? Um, now in Okoe, uh, there is an incident where Okoe is this small agricultural community right outside of Orlando, like maybe 20 minutes outside of Orlando. And um, um, in Okoe, there's an African-American man who registers to vote um, in 1920, something he had done previously. It wasn't a, a controversial thing, per se. But he, and a, he brings another uh, black gentleman with him to go register to vote excuse me, in Orlando in the county register's office. And he's asked to leave. Um, and he leaves and he says something, like he just, you know, he says something uh, to denote the indignity. And the story goes around and then um, a group of white, uh, group of white men come to his, um, to his home in Okoe and there's a shootout. Um, and the entire town of Okoe, which had a sizable African American population because of the agricultural community, is sort of wiped out. Um, overnight, uh, all the African Americans who had lived in Okoe um, either die or are driven out of Okoe. And Okoe becomes a white town for, I believe, like the next 80 years. Um, like when I moved to, when I moved to uh, Orlando in 2003, um, I knew about Okoe just because I knew about Okoe as a historian. Um, but people didn't talk about Okoe in 2003. It just wasn't. You know, it wasn't something, you know, white folks sort of put kibosh in a poem um, about talking about this. And folks in Orlando did all the time when I moved there. But there were these groups who would regularly meet to talk about a poem, talk about the history of a poem, and share the story and things like this. And it's changed so much that, you know, I think when we approach the 100th anniversary of a poem, you know, now there's a placard back to remind people of uh, July Perry, who was, who was lynched in Okoe, the gentleman who, who wanted to vote. Um, and, you know, the legislature passed something to commemorate Okoe and Okoe in the classroom and things like that. All right, I know I went kind of long here, so I want to stop. Yeah. What's that? We're at the, because yeah. the exhibit has to <laughs> Oh, stop here. So, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I think we, we could still do some, some questions, but if you do not have any questions and would like to peel off to go see the exhibit, it's open downstairs and we can still entertain a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Very good. That was interesting about the yeah. constitution.